Good afternoon, Saster. Should we go sit down? My name is Michael Greenwich. I'm the founder of WorkOS. We also have Betsy Callender with us, who leads our developer success team, and Zina Rocha, who runs developer Hello. experience at WorkOS. We're here to talk about developer-led growth and what that means for you all building SaaS businesses. Quick show of hands, how many of you in the audience are technical, are engineers? How many of you have products that have an API? Okay. How many of you are API first, meaning your first primary product is an API? Okay, just a few of you. So we come from WorkOS, which is a company that helps other businesses become enterprise ready. There are a bunch of different features required by enterprise IT admins. And we deliver those features through an API. So we're an API first company, which means that we focus primarily on selling to developers. So this talk today is all gonna be about that. How to price your product for developers, how to market it to developers, um, how, to, uh, how to support them as they scale and use the product, and why this is different than typical um, SaaS businesses and typical SaaS the, products. Uh, anybody here? No, right? We have a ton of content to cover <laughs> in only about 20 minutes, so please buckle up and hold on. Let's get started. People who... Okay, doing business with developers. So probably the first question that I should answer is just why on earth should you build for developers? It's a, a little bit of a newer motion being API first. Developers aren't usually the primary consumer of most software products. So why even consider building for developers first? Well, in the past several years, there's been a tremendous number of companies that have built specifically for developers and use this as a way to get into these new markets, to displace incumbents and disrupt the competition. Whether that's a company like Heroku, which started you know, over a decade ago, building a platform for developers, or even something like Stripe, which has completely changed the financial industry, going through developers is often a new, novel way to disrupt those existing companies and kind of use it as a growth uh, propellant to get into those, those industries. This also doesn't seem to be slowing down. As an example for Twilio, they were able effectively to build a next generation telecom through an API. They were able to take the entire world of telephony and reduce it down to a few API calls. I'm gonna try to... Gardner's also noticing, for those of you that follow industry reports, 98% of organizations, pretty much everyone, plans to use internal APIs. 94% plans to use public APIs. It's pretty much every company in the world at this point is using APIs for developers. So if anyone's told you the market for APIs and developers is not strong, um, they're behind the times. There are things that are different about selling to developers as well, and specifically developer-led growth is a new motion for many companies. You've probably heard of product-led growth, where you have something like a freemium motion to acquire customers. Developer-led growth is like that, but a bit different, um, with characteristics around self-serve onboarding similar to freemium. This allows you to have like a really cheap acquisition for customers, but the billing model is typically a little bit different as well, with usage-based and consumption-based models. There's quite a bit of things that are actually subtly different when selling to developers. So why sell to these developers? You know, it's clear that the market is, is large, but why is this actually happening? Why is this transition occurring? The main difference here that's happened in the last few years is developers used to only influence product decisions, but they didn't actually have budget authority. They couldn't buy anything. That's no longer the case. Developers today control an incredible amount of budget. They're able to actually swipe a credit card and really have what you would experience as like a freemium self-serve product starting off turn into a six-figure contract in the case of a few months. This is completely different. This is one of the biggest changes that's happened in the tech industry of the last 10 years, is developers having buying authority. And you don't just have to take my word for it. People have studied this, there's data. This is even from four years ago. Almost 60% of developers saying they have authority to buy software. Despite it seeming like it's hard to hire developers in the world, there's more and more of them every year. It's a segment that's growing very, very quickly. And not just in the US, it's growing globally. So the US has the largest developer population today. India is growing extremely fast as well. So is APAC and Latin America. So becoming an API first company actually allows you to not only be developer first, but actually global first from the very beginning. There's a bit of a different motion. So for those of you familiar with typical SaaS businesses where you might sell top down from a sales led approach, 
you'll start with like a management vision, and then it'll filter down to developers actually using the product and executing on it. So the deal is signed first, and then the implementation happens second. With developer products, it's actually the opposite. Oftentimes, the implementation happens. They've done the integration before management might even know that they're using a product. You know, it might be months later that a VP of engineering or a CTO or a CFO realizes that they're built on a new platform. And so this structurally is also different from, from go to market. Um, and requires really rethinking how your entire organization is structured. So like I said, there's a lot of changes in this. I also want to talk really quickly about pricing. Developers hate opaque pricing. If you have a pricing page that says contact us, developers will just close the tab and leave, which is very different than most SaaS companies, right? If you're selling, you, you actually want sales to engage. It needs to be free or it's super cheap, super affordable to get started. Just put in a credit card, it needs to be a transactional sale. And it needs to be usage based, so developers aren't paying for things that they're not using. Just as like a quick anecdote at WorkOS, we have companies that sign up, a developer puts in a credit card, and months later it can turn into a six-figure contract without necessarily even a sales team engaging. So this motion really works. It's very different than typical, typical SaaS sales. And the magic of developer products and the pricing model is the expansion. So you have the opportunity to upsell new features and capabilities to them. Their contract size grows. If you've ever measured things like net dollar retention or negative churn, developer products are off the charts here. You'll have people spending an order of magnitude more money a year later than they did when they signed up. <coughs> Excuse me. And a couple of pitfalls just to mention on pricing. Developers absolutely hate paying for something they're not using. Getting them to commit to some minimum because it satisfies a sales quota and then a year later them not feeling like they actually got the value out of it uh, really stings developers. It really burns that relationship. You also don't want to have friction in the buying process and setup process. I mentioned that freemium type of self-serve experience is super, super important with developers. They'll evaluate your product for months without even contacting you. It happens all the time. And lastly, for developers, you really want to talk about the capabilities of what's, what it's being offered, kind of like what the features actually do, and not necessarily use language like unlock revenue or you know, unlock sales, something that might be more applicable to a, a business decision maker. Developers really care about what the product actually lets them do, what it lets them accomplish. So this is a quick overview of a bunch of different things that you care about, that, that you should care about if you're building an API first product, and how that's different than a typical maybe SaaS top-down enterprise sale. The next thing we want to talk about is how to market to developers, because this is super hard to do and very different. Developers typically don't like typical marketing. Uh, if you're trying to do email marketing, they don't read their email. Uh, they probably will never respond to your LinkedIn messages. So we're going to talk about a few tricks and a little bit of black magic that's needed to market to developers. And for that, I will hand it over to Zeno from our team. Thank you, Michael. Cool. Hey, everybody. So to talk about marketing, we need to talk about branding first and how you create a brand that is sustainable with developers. That's a really hard thing to do. Not for the next year or for the next month, but for the next five or 10 years, right? And it always starts with all these small details, all these little things that you do in your product, you know? From the landing page to your documentation to your dashboard, all these little delights is what ultimately creates a brand that developers are gonna love, that they're gonna praise, and they're gonna promote and talk to their friends and recommend to them. The opposite is also true, right? Like you go to a documentation, you try something, and then there's a typo, you know? You go to your dashboard, you try the API, and then the API you know, has a timeout. All of these little frustrations creates a brand that developers are not gonna really trust, or they're gonna be indifferent to it, which is probably the worst thing you can have for a brand, and this could ultimately lead to uh, churn, which you definitely don't want in a SaaS business. So branding to developers is all about precision, and not just thinking about precision, but being obsessed about precision. Every error, every small thing that you do, it's gonna have a high cost, and you really wanna keep that credibility with them. Mike already touched about this, you know, like marketing is typically made when you're talking about the benefits and not the features. That's what we all listen to as we're like going into marketing. But with developers, that's counterintuitive and actually can be harmful as well. So you really want to focus on the actual things that this product is going to help you with. Not only like, hey, this is how you're going to transform your life. No, I just want to solve a problem. Show me how to solve that problem. 
let's take a look at an, an example here, right? Like this is what companies do. You have a landing page, you have like this really aspirational tagline, you have some CTAs going around, you describe the features in a really aspirational way, but this is what developers see when they look at this. When they see that transformational uh, promise, they're like, mm, I just wanna know what this does. You know, just tell me what it is straight away. Okay, if there's a CTA, if there's a free product, you know, I'm already a little bit skeptical. Maybe there's gonna be like a lot of automated marketing emails that I'm gonna get. And then you have like all these benefits, all these promises. And again, there's uh, some doubt with those things if they're really like promising really big things, right? And that's the same with gated content. We learned that we need to capture those leads, we need to get those email addresses. And how we do it, uh, it's really tricky with developers because they're gonna ignore you at any attempt that you have to convert them. They can feel it. So if you try to convert to your special webinar or this event that you're doing, you know, you should be really careful about the language that you're gonna use. This is another example, right? You have this amazing landing page and you have a form for people to download your ebook. You have been working for months on this new resource. When they see that, the first thing they might think is like, I don't wanna read a PDF, you know, I don't like PDFs. This could be a GitHub repo, or a blog post, or a website, or anything but a PDF. Uh, if still I decide to go there, maybe I'm, I'm gonna fill this form with my fake name or a disposable email address, and even if you tell me that I can unsubscribe later, the truth is it's probably gonna be hard, I probably have to block your email, so keep that in mind uh, as you're trying to have gated content in your, in your application. What about channels? What are some of the places that you can explore and places that you can find developers? The, the trick here is to find developers where they are. If you try to do something in a way that is not really authentic to them, they are gonna feel it. So instead of like trying to exchange cards, like, you know, feel like, uh, think about this as a way to be like as authentic as possible. So if you can, make them follow you, that's probably a much better thing to do because then you can keep engaging with them later on. These are some of the channels you can explore. Hacker News is a really good place. Dev.2, Twitter is still extremely relevant with that audience, and Stack Overflow is a place where they go to find answers. The different formats that you explore within marketing is also uh, a really interesting thing, right? Some people, they might like blog posts, others might like videos, or some just, just, just want to see the code right away. They want to skip all that and see the source code. So a couple of examples that uh, might be familiar or helpful for you as you're thinking about this is Twilio is one of them. You can see all the different samples that they offer, and that's for that type of developer that just wants to see the code. Another one is Live Blocks. They build this really nice page where you can see examples live, you know, and that's, again, really interesting thing for you to explore. The voice and the tone is crucial with developers. That's something that if you make a small mistake, they're gonna notice too. So, again, developers are really skeptical about marketing. You have to be really careful. And a way to bypass that is to Prove yourself as a highly technical resource, you know? Write content that they can relate to that feels technical enough, and do things that are challenging on the technical side, too. Stripe is very famous for building this globe on their landing page, and when you go to their website and you see that, you're like, oh, wow, that's nice. Uh, Scale.com, they have this super abstract animation going on. You look at that and it's like, okay, what's the meaning of that animation? Does really offer any value, but it does show you that, okay, this is a group of folks that are really technical, they can do amazing things, so maybe their product is amazing as well. What about leads? What about qualifying those leads? The, the secret here is not to try to hide your motives. Instead, you can be really clear. You know, the, think about a, the, the job as a developer. You are all day like building workflows, maybe building forms. So if you try to do things like this, you know, you're trying to qualify someone as they sign up in your product, and you have fields like legal name, work email, this is how developers see this uh, in practice. That promise that you have, that 30-day trial, they read that and say, wow, uh, I'm definitely gonna get spam after there's 30 days, you know, those emails trying to convert me later on. Legal name, why is that? Are you gonna run a background check on me? Work email, why not my personal email? 
phone number? Really? You're going to call me? I just want to try that product. I don't want to get a call from anybody. Job title? Okay, maybe if I'm a, uh, an executive, I might choose a different one because I don't want to be qualified as an executive and talk to a salesperson. The opposite could also be true, like, oh, maybe I'm a developer, but I, I want to talk to somebody. Oh, maybe I'm going to lie in this field. Same with, like, the company size. Depending on that, like, oh, just, I'm just trying this. Let me put, like, a smaller company size so I don't get a call from anybody. And then finally, the password. That's what I want to do. I just want to sign up to this product. Ultimately, with developers, word of mouth is what counts. That's the best way of doing marketing in any type of segment, really. Developers are really loyal. So if you really get their trust, if you are as authentic as possible, that's going to be your best marketing channel. The best product, ultimately, is, what, is what's going to win. So make sure that you focus on that and foster that experience as best as possible. Now, to talk about how to support developers, I'll pass it over to Betsy, who's going to talk a little bit more about that. Thanks. Thank you, Zeno. Awesome. So now that we've learned how to sell to developers and how to market to developers, how do we support developers? What tools should we use? How, what things should we avoid? So let's start about tooling. All right, so we want to use a tool that developers are already using, Slack. Slack is a great tool to communicate with developers. It ultimately reduces the friction so that they have Slack already open, you can navigate to it and communicate with feedback and support questions. We also extend our support to help our customers' customers. And this really enables us to be uh, a knowledge center and really build that trust with developers. We also want to not just be reactive, but be proactive. And so constantly letting our developers know about upcoming changes, of things that they, they need to do, know what to take action on, and a lot of different notification, all in the same familiar tool of Slack. And this is, again, going along the theme of reducing the friction. We want to make the ease of communication between developers and the support team as easy as possible. So we don't want to have them fill out a long form or add in too, way too much automation that you know, can potentially reduce, uh, reduce the engagement, increase frustration. And we just don't want that. We want our developers to trust us and really want to interact with us. Really, because developers give amazing feedback. So we want to make sure that we get that feedback, we gather it, we present it internally to our whole company so we, everyone understands what our customers are saying, what developers are saying, and because developers have amazing ideas. So we want to integrate the feedback directly into the product so it's easy to give that feedback. We can take it visible, visibly to our whole company so we can talk about it. And then we want to make sure we close that feedback loop. Because it's really annoying if you give a piece of feedback and you never hear back from it. So we want to make sure that we are being very responsive and build, continuing to build that trust. So if we decide we don't want to work on it or if it's something that's awesome, we'll add it to our product. And then we will let our customers know that we added this back. And it is super great when you close that feedback loop. The other thing that is super important is for us to actually use our product and actually test it out before we release it to our developers. Our team needs to be experts before we even show it off to the rest, rest of the world. So we do a lot of internal dog fooding, and so we'll test out the product, we'll create example applications, we'll do everything possible, everything that our customers are doing so that we can support them very well and also to give feedback internally. We can find the bugs or the, some friction points and let our team know that's building it to fix them. Um, we also help um, build new features um, you know, constantly, so we just want to make sure that they are fully you know, tested and wonderful before we release them. And now I'm going to turn it back to Michael to clo close us out. All right, our time is almost up for today. So just to recap, I wanted to talk about a few things we've overviewed that we've learned by building a product and selling to developers. There's more than just this talk. Here's just a handful. Be developer zero. Proactively communicate with your customers. Build for expansion. That expansion effect is a huge part of developer businesses. Make sure to start for free. Don't have that contact sales button or request a demo button. Gate the content. 
And then just generally avoid gating content. Try to have as much as possible open for developers signing up. We are obsessed with building products for developers. If you would like to chat with us more about this, we have a booth just down there in between Brex and Google. We'd love to chat with you more about this. Whether you're thinking about adding an API to your product, you already have an API, or you're considering launching a new business that's API first. We'd love to share everything we've learned building a business around developers. And of course, if you have questions around how to make your app enterprise ready, we can talk with you about that too. Mm. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of Saster.